Good evening, and welcome to the New Haven Museum. I'm Trina Lernan. I'm the president of our museum's board of directors. And on behalf of the board and staff, thank you for joining us this evening. This is, and you're here for it, our very first in-person lecture since COVID. <laughs> and we're thrilled to have you back with us again. So thank you very, very much. I think you're brave, but I also think you're very wise. So thank you. <laughs> For those joining us virtually this evening, we say welcome to. Please know that you can always join us online for our talks by going to our Facebook page where we are streaming live. You don't need an account, and if you missed a talk or you'd like to see it again, of course you would, you may <laughs> access it later. You can also find our talks archived on the museum's YouTube channel. That's right, we have a YouTube channel. And our staff will be happy to assist you or answer any questions you have. Thanks to our education director, Khalil Quota, there he is, for coordinating these logistics. Thanks, guys. Some housekeeping. We ask that you stay masked during the talk unless it is medically impossible or you happen to be the featured speaker. <laughs> I want to clarify that. The restrooms are on the first floor. That is an odd segue, but I guess <laughs> essential. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also an elevator, should you prefer that, the stairs. It is just around the rotunda on the left before you enter. The fact that you're already up here may mean that you've already found it. So. We opened a new exhibition today, lots of excitement, in conjunction with tonight's talk. Point of Departure in New Haven, 1822, tells the story of 14 missionaries who set sail from New Haven 200 years ago in November 1822 for the Sandwich Islands, which is today, of course, Hawaii. I'd like to thank our guest curator, Sandra Markham, for this fascinating look at the Elm City, these extraordinary visitors, and the local residents who welcomed them and helped them prepare for their journey. I'd also like to recognize the museum's collections manager, Mary Chris, who, for coordinating the exhibition details. And if you weren't able to see the exhibition earlier, just come back in the coming weeks. It will remain on view through the end of April 2023. Tonight's talk is co-sponsored by the Hawaiian Mission Houses Historic Site and Archives located in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hawaiian Mission Houses preserves and shares Hawaii's history from 1820 through 1862, during which time the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions sent 12 companies of missionaries to Hawaii. The interactions between the missionaries and the Ali, or the ruling class, sorry for stumbling over that, resulted in the establishment and printing of the Hawaiian language, an in, the introduction of Christianity, the development of medicine by combine, combining native and Western practices, the establishment of a constitutional monarchy, and the development of harmonic music forms in Hawaiian music. Hawaiian Mission Houses digital archives, virtual tours of the site, and online gift shop of local items are available worldwide, including here in New Haven. Now, to introduce tonight's speaker, we have Elizabeth Lentz Hill, MFA, an executive team member and director of development at Hawaiian Mission House. Thank you, Trina, and thank you to everyone here tonight. Aloha mai kako. Good evening and warm aloha to everyone gathered here and everyone joining us at home online. It is a joy and an honor to introduce tonight's speaker. To give a little additional context to this talk tonight and about why I'm here, Hawaiian Mission Houses is in the midst of commemorating some significant bicentennial anniversaries, which began in 2018 with the 200th anniversary of Henry Opakahi'ia's death. And Henry Opakahi'ia was the man who inspired the mission to the Sandwich Islands, as it was called at the time. These bicentennials continue with the departure of the pioneer company of missionaries from Boston in 1819, their arrival in Hawaii in 1820, the Ali'i granting permission to build the mission house, which was erected in 1821 and which Hawaiian Mission Houses continues to preserve today. The first printing in Olelo Hawaii, which is the Hawaiian language, in January of 1822 and the arrival of Tahitian missionaries in April of 1822, who helped put Christianity into a Polynesian context and worked with members of what was then the Sandwich Islands Mission and with Hawaiian scholars to develop the written Hawaiian language. 
Add to 1822 the departure of the second company of missionaries from right here in New Haven as they answered the call of the Hawaiian Ali'i and the pioneer company of missionaries to send more teachers to assist in teaching reading and writing and general education throughout the Hawaiian kingdom. This is where the story of Betsy Stockton intersects with the Sandwich Island Mission, intersects with my personal story because my antecedents, the bishops, were in the second company with Betsy Stockton and with all of our lives here tonight. It is a joy to get to hear Dr. Gregory Nobles discuss his research in his new book, The Education of Betsy Stockton, An Odyssey of Slavery and Freedom. Dr. Nobles, Professor Emeritus of History at Georgia Tech University, spent 33 years as a specialist on early American history and environmental history. In addition to teaching, Dr. Nobles was Associate Dean of the Ivan Allen College, Chair of the School of History, Technology, and Society, and Founding Director of the Georgia Tech Honors Program. He held two Fulbright professorships and has received numerous research grants, including three from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and residential fellowships, including at the American Antiquarian Society, the Princeton University Library, and the Newberry Library. In 2004, Dr. Nobles was named to the Distinguished Lectureship Program of the Organization of American Historians, and for 2005 to 2008, was elected to the Advisory Council of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, or SHEER. Dr. Nobles also served SHEER as a member of the editorial board of the Journal of the Early Republic and on the Book Prize Committee. After retiring from Georgia Tech, Dr. Nobles was the 2016 to 17 Mellon Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the American Antiquarian Society, and for 2018 to 2019 was the Robert C. Ritchie Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the Huntington Library. In addition to the education of Betsy Stockton, Dr. Nobles has co-authored several books, including John James Audubon, The Nature of the American Woodsman. Please join me in welcoming this, remar excuse me, this remarkable man to speak about a remarkable woman, Dr. Nobles. Well, thank you, Trina, and thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you especially for providing so much historical context for this. You've made my job a lot easier this evening. Um, I want to thank everybody at the uh, New Haven Historical Museum for making this uh, event possible, for sponsoring this remarkable exhibit. Uh, and I do have to say a special thanks to Khalil Kutep for uh, taking care of the technological side of this, which is always a source of great anxiety. <laughs> but I also want to say uh, a special word to Sandra Markham and to Elizabeth Lent Hill once again because they have been working for quite some time at the very far ends of this nation of ours and bringing us all together here in New Haven tonight. I'm very grateful for the work they did, the coordination they provided for this. And I have to say a special thank you uh, to a couple of colleagues, uh, Jonathan Stockton and, and Chris Cook, uh, for very kindly answering my many emails about what's going on in the Mission Houses uh, Museum world. So thank you very much to them. And frankly, thanks to all of you for coming tonight, and to those people out there in the virtual world, thank you too. It's good to have you here, or at least somewhere. <laughs> I am very happy to be here because I think this is a wonderful exhibit. I had the opportunity to tour it carefully today, uh, and I'll be back, but I think it's also a wonderful exhibit that commemorates a remarkable event. And this is the event that got us here. This is the departure of the ABCFM, the second batch of ABCFM missionaries in November 1822. Now, I like this image. I like especially the perspective of this image because it's looking back from the water at Tomlinson's Wharf. It's looking with the land in the background. And there you have the people assembled on the dock. They're kind of standing around, maybe shaking hands in a few cases. But in the background, it's those tree-lined streets, probably elm streets, uh, elm trees, I'm assuming here, that that's where they're going to leave. And probably leave forever. They're making a one-way trip to the Pacific, or at least so they think. They're going halfway around the world to Hawaii, to the Sandwich Islands, as they were called at the time, going away with a sense of mission, but also, I think, with a sense of finality. They're expecting to die 
on the far side of the world. And there are the men in the rowboats about to take them out to the ship, the Thames, the whale ship, a whale ship that will take them out of New Haven, out of the United States, and frankly, out of the world that they knew. And into what? Into what? They don't know, but they know that they're ready to go. Now, as we look at this image, we can't really tell who's who. We can't tell which ones are the six married couples uh, among the missionaries, almost all of them newlyweds within the past couple of months. In fact, in some within the past few days before this departure. We can't see the four men from the Pacific Islands, the three men from uh, Hawaii, or the one man from Tahiti. We can't tell who's the other single man in the group, Levi Chamberlain, who worked so very hard to assemble all the supplies for this trip. And we can't tell who's the only single woman heading off to the boat, the only black woman in the picture, the first black woman to go as a missionary to Hawaii, and that is Betsy Scott. Now this picture, I have to say, was taken in 1863, 41 years after she left New Haven. It's the only, er only image we have. There's nothing earlier I certainly wish there were, but there's not. But it is Betsy Stockton I want to talk about this evening, the young Betsy Stockton, before she came to New Haven, who she was, and how she came to be in New Haven as part of this larger missionary group, why she came to be a missionary, and what that meant, what that meant in her life. Now I have to note here, I won't be talking about the rest of Betsy Stockton's life, her time as a missionary in Hawaii, uh, her time when she comes back to the United States and Cooperstown, New York, and Philadelphia, and Cooperstown again, and then for the longest period of her life in Princeton, New Jersey. But I will be happy to talk about that during the question and answer period. But I think the larger question I have is, uh, The, the world before she went on this trip, the world before her travels. Uh, my friend and Yale professor David Blight tells us that Frederick Douglass uh, was probably the most traveled black man in America. I think Betsy Stockton might have been the most traveled black woman in antebellum America, certainly for a woman born into slavery as she was. But this evening I want to talk about her, her early years, about her early history, and how that can help locate her in a larger history of the United States, which I'll try to do in the end. Betsy Stockton wrote something about her own history. She wrote, here begins the history of things known only to those who have bid the American shores a long adieu. Here begins the history of things known only to those who have bid the American shores a long ado. That's the opening line from the journal she had kept while she was on board the Thames, covering her five months on, on the ship, her first days in Hawaii, and her life with the members of the missionary family and with the mariners on board the ship. I always think this is a remarkable mix of missionaries and mariners, pious people and frankly sometimes quite uncouth people. <laughs> but it turned out to be a remarkable mixture. But in that first line, when she talks about bidding the American shores a long adieu, one asks, why the adieu? Why is she leaving? Why is she bidding farewell? And for me, the question is, how does she see her own life? How does she see her history at that time? How does she see her life on the American shores before she got onto the Thames to sail away and sail away again, presumably forever? Well, unfortunately, she doesn't tell us that. She doesn't leave much else written in her own hand, spoken in her own voice. All we have, really, is the journal she wrote while on board uh, the Thames on her voyage to the Pacific, and then a couple of letters, uh, a last will and testament, a few other scraps, and that's that. That's all we have from Betsy Stockton herself. There is no Betsy Stockton archive that you could find in a building like this. There is no trove of documents about Betsy Stockton written by Betsy Stockton. Now, I have to say, that's a common problem that comes up frequently, especially for black people, people of color in the past. The archives are full of documents written by and about white people, and especially white men, but not so much, not so much for people of color, people like Betsy Stockton. 
So as a historian, as a biographer, the question is, what do you do about that? How do you work around that? Well, you learn to take the scraps you can get. You make of them what you can. You try to get some sense of the person or the personality, frankly. And in the case of Betsy Stockton, her journal gives me some insight into parts of her personality that I think are enduring. Her piety, her spirituality, certainly above all. Her intellect, her worries, her concerns, both personal and, and broader. But also even her, her sense of humor. And as I read her Pacific journal, I got to know her, at least I hope I did. And I tried to keep that sense of her in mind as I wrote about the rest of her life and frankly, as I wrote the rest of my book. I also read what other people wrote about, which was a lot, uh, but I knew that I had to read that with some measure of skepticism, uh, to ask questions about the perspective of the person doing the writing, to read against the grain, as it were, of what's said and what's said by whom, especially when it was white people writing about Betsy Stockton, to see if there might be alternative meanings and, and again, to try to always be aware of the larger historical context and try to see Stockton within that context and try to understand her, not just in terms of what she said or didn't say, frankly, but what she did and within the world around her. Here's an example of what I mean. Most of what we know about Betsy Stockton comes from one source, one man. And this is Asheville Green. Ashville Green was a graduate of the College of New Jersey, later called Princeton, a graduate in the class of 1783. He was a valedictorian, although only 14 students, but nonetheless, he was a valedictorian. <laughs> he became, in 1787, pastor of Philadelphia's Second Presbyterian Church, which was a very prominent position in Philadelphia, one of the most prominent uh, pulpits that there could be. He served as a uh, chaplain to the Congress while it sat in Philadelphia in the 1790s. He was a very, very successful man by the time that Betsy Stockton came into his life, came into his household. Green wrote later that Betsy had been given, as he put it, given as a slave to his wife, Elizabeth Stockton Green, uh, the daughter of Pitt Green's father-in-law, Robert Stockton. Robert Stockton was one of the most prominent men in Princeton, New Jersey. He was the owner of a, an estate uh, in Princeton, Constitution Hill, and he was also a slaveholder. And Betsy's mother, her birth mother, was probably one of the enslaved women on Robert Stockton's estate, perhaps probably a woman named Celia. The man involved was probably one of Stockton's sons, a white man to be sure. Uh, actually, I have to pause here. A Robert Stockton descendant one time emailed me and said she had a pretty good guess of which one of Robert Stockton's sons it was. She said it might, must have been Job because he was the odd one. <laughs> no idea, who knows? But nonetheless, uh, there are a lot of questions about that. But as a young child, Betsy's take, taken away from her birth mother. She's given to the Greens, again, given as a slave, as Ashville Green writes. She becomes Ashville Green's responsibility, his property. And the very first time, the very first time Betsy Stockton appears in the historical record is in Ashville Green's diary. And I have to tell you, Ashville Green's diary is some several thousand pages long, now happily all typed up in, in, in boxes in the Princeton uh, Library, so it's good to, good to look at. But he writes this in September of 1804. <coughs> Beth played the mischief, and that was the account for that day. The next day he writes, puked up my breakfast, corrected Beth, and that's all he says. That's all he says, not about what sort of mischief she played, not about what he did to correct her, and the line of correction can be very broad. It could be verbal admonition, it could be physical abuse. I do know, by the way, from his diary, that when Green corrects one of his own sons, he slaps him. Green could lose control of his emotions, and he could be abusive in time. Well, in any event, we see Ashville Green exercising his authority as master over Betsy, over this enslaved young girl. And yet we also know, by Green's own telling, that he was uncomfortable in his role as slaveholder. In 1821, 
He writes that by my wife and me, Betsy was never intended to be held as a slave. And at, soon after Green's wife Elizabeth dies in 1807, January of 1807, Green emancipates Betsy from slavery. Now I say soon, but I don't know exactly when. Maybe in 1807, maybe a bit later. There's no emancipation document, no freedom papers for Betsy Stockton that exist, and I've looked for them throughout Philadelphia. The best evidence really comes from the 1810 census for Philadelphia, which shows that Ashville Green has no enslaved people living in his household. He has two young people who are identified as all other free persons, which just means they're not white, but they're not enslaved either. And I think one of those people, one of those other free persons, was Betsy Stockton. And that's where the larger context matters. Slavery by 1810 was on its way out in Pennsylvania, and certainly in Philadelphia. Not gone, but just on its, on its way out. Pennsylvania in, in 1780 had passed a law for gradual abolition, but it was very, very gradual. A person born into slavery after 1780 would still have to serve over 20 years, and then perhaps be granted emancipation. So it was very, very a gradual process. And yet still, in that period of gradual abolition, uh, with that law on the books, and with some pressure, frankly, from abolitionists, both black and white, some slaveholders began to make different arrangements with the people they enslaved. They would give them freedom from slavery, but keep them in some other form of unfreedom, perhaps as an indentured servant or in some other condition. And that's what I think was Betsy Stockton's condition in 1810. She was technically not enslaved, but she was still subject to Asheville Green's authority. And he exercised that authority. In 1812, Asheville Green uh, left Philadelphia. He was named president of the College of New Jersey, or Princeton as it's come to be called. And he took Betsy with him to Princeton. And they lived together in that house, the president's house on the right side of the slide. Uh, lived in a very uh, modest sized house and in very, very close quarters. But then less than a year later, in 1813, when Betsy was 15, he sold her, or he sold three years of her time. He didn't sell her body, but he sold her time and sent her away to live with a relative, another Presbyterian pastor down in Woodbury, New Jersey, Nathaniel Todd. Uh, I'll try this. Uh, Princeton is up here, it's not on the map. Woodbury is down here. It wasn't that far away, but the point was, he was getting her out of his house. And after he sells Betsy's time and sends her down to Woodbury to, to Reverend Todd, he almost immediately buys the time of two other black teenagers, a young man named John, a young woman named Phoebe, and they're there to replace Betsy. And so I have to ask, what's going on here? What's going on here? Green may not keep anybody actually enslaved, neither Betsy nor John nor Phoebe, but he has the power the legal power, and he exercises that power to buy and sell the bodies of these black teenagers. And again, not their bodies, but their time. And these teenagers, Betsy, John, Phoebe, have nothing to say about it. Well, Green tried to explain later why he did this in Betsy's case. He said he considered her, as he put it, wild and thoughtless, if not vicious. And he sends her away for her own good, he said. I think he also sends her away for his own good. He's a college president, which sounds like a lofty position, but for his case it wasn't. He's surrounded and hounded by a number of unruly students, most of them not much older than Betsy Stockton herself. His students are making fun of him all the time. They're setting off explosives. They're burning down the campus buildings, especially the privy. Uh, and Green is just beset by these, uh, these undergraduates at, at, at Princeton. And he can't get rid of them. At least he can't get rid of them all, but he could get rid of Betsy, and he does. So again, he sells three years of her time, I think, taking some of his anxiety about teenagers in general and projecting them onto her and getting her out of his house. So off she goes to Woodbury, New Jersey for three years. But then in the summer of 1816, that time's up. She comes back to Princeton, back to the household of Asheville Green, and at this point, she makes a very significant step in her life. She joins the Presbyterian Church. 
which is the church in town. It includes almost all the Princeton students and the faculty, not to mention the leadership of the town. And now around 18 or so, she's deemed to, you can see it, maybe it says, she uh, uh, exhibits good conduct. And so the church accepts her as a full member. She is a full-fledged Presbyterian. I have to say, this is the first time, by the way, I've seen her full name, Betsy Stockton, Betsy Ann Stockton. And I think that somewhere in this process of returning to Princeton in 1816, she takes the name Stockton for herself. Ashville Green never, in his diary before this, refers to her as a last name. It was Bet, Betty, Betsy, but never you know, any mention of Stockton. And I think in this case, it's, a, it's a, 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 an example of self-naming, which was common for formerly enslaved people to take a name, sometimes even the name of, of their enslaver. But here's the larger context. About the time she comes back to Princeton, in fact, the same summer, 1816, she could also see this ad in local newspaper. Another young woman, about the same age as Betsy, 19, is being offered for sale. She's being offered for sale by a man named Elijah Slack, who happens to be a member of the Princeton faculty, a member of the Princeton Presbyterian Church. He's one of Asheville Green's colleagues. And that, I think, is Princeton in the 18-teens, at a time when Betsy Stockton is in her teens as well. She can be part of Asheville Green's family. She can be a member of the church, although she has to sit in the balcony with other black people in the church, but nonetheless, she's part of the congregation. But she also knows what it's like to be sold. She knows what can happen to a young woman like herself. Now, there's another bit of evidence from the same time, a little bit of happier evidence, I would think. Um, and I have to say that sometimes doing historical research, you just get lucky. And I got enormously lucky one day. I was first doing research at the American Antiquarian Society in, in Worcester, Mass. And someone mentioned that a rare book dealer in Princeton, New Jersey, a man named Joseph Falcone, had a book with Betsy Stockton's signature in the flyleaf. Well, you can bet I got in touch with Joseph Falcone very quickly, got myself down to Princeton, and there, on the third floor of his remarkable house full of books, was the book. It was, the book was The Flower of Literature, Flowers of Literature by Thomas Brannigan, but what impressed me, what gripped me, was the flyleaf. Betsy Stock, right there. He let me hold the book, let me hold in my hands a book she had held in her hands 200 years before. It was a, a, a magical moment. And I had to ask, well, when did she get the book? I, I don't know. Probably in 1816, 17, 18, sometime while she was back living with Asheville Green. How did she get it? I don't know. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe she saved some money and bought it. But the point is, she had it. She had it and she wrote her name in it, which is something I think many of us do when we get a book. We put our name so we know it's ours. And I think it's a, it was a remarkable moment. It's an act of possession by a young woman who had been considered a possession herself. Well, I thank Joe Falcone uh, for letting me see the book, letting me touch it. I went back to my research, and so I got a copy of The Flowers of Literature, and I read it. It is not a great book. <laughs> it's a compendium of biblical and oral history, which is fine, uh, but here's the point about this book, and the point I think was important for Betsy Stockton. It has a very compelling preface, one that I think would have appealed to Betsy Stockton at the time she acquired it. In the preface, Thomas Brannigan writes to parents, take care of your children's souls. Fine, that's good advice. Then he writes to children, you were born to die, which is rather tough advice to children, but they should take that into account. Too. But then he writes to teachers, a special word to teachers. And he writes that you teachers have a special responsibility to the young. You can save young people through education. You can do this. It's you. And so I tried to read that preface, as I thought Betsy Stockton might have read it. That appeal, that a challenge to teachers came at a time in the late 1810s when, teens, when Betsy Stockton was beginning to take up 
that challenge herself. She wants to become a teacher. Now we know this not from Betsy Stockton herself, but from a young man named Michael Osborne, who was a student at the Princeton Theological Seminary, who knew Betsy Stockton from church. He knew her from his Sunday school class. And he wrote about her emerging commitment to education. First of all, to her own education, how she had taught herself to read, but read not just the ABCs, not just the three R's, as it were, but she had become quite sophisticated in her reading. She had a deep knowledge of literature, and theology. Osborne doesn't mention it, but I have a feeling that she also saw this book before going to New Haven. This is a New Jersey 1819 version of the memoirs of Henry Abuki. If I ever found this book with Betsy Stockton's signature in the in the library, <laughs> that would be a real find. But on the whole, we do know that Betsy Stockton was a voracious reader uh, as a young woman. In fact, I, I argue in my book that she was not just literate, she was a real intellectual. In her Thames Journal, she quotes from the Bible, she quotes from Milton, she quotes from other poetic sources, and there's no reference library on board this ship. She couldn't go down and look it up. She had it locked in her head. Young Mr. Osborne observes another thing about Betsy, that she's become committed to becoming a teacher. She wants to teach black children in Princeton, but that's not possible. She wants to teach children elsewhere, children somewhere. She wants to go, Osborne tells us, on a mission. And that becomes Betsy Stockton's calling as a missionary, as a teacher. Now that's fine, and it might even be rather benign seeming, a missionary teacher. But it's not so easy, something I think we simply cannot take for granted. Nobody asked Betsy Stockton to become a teacher. Nobody showed her how. She never went to a formal school a day in her life, never had a role model, never saw a teacher really teaching. And I think she also had to know, even as a teenager, even as a teenager, that her options, especially in Princeton, New Jersey, were very, very limited. In Princeton, most black women worked as domestics, they worked as washerwomen, but there were no black teachers. There was no opportunity for a well-read woman like herself to find that kind of calling in that kind of community. And so she goes off on this mission. Now on one level, I think she's seeking a, a, a spiritual path. Becoming a missionary might be the best way for her to do the work she felt compelled, she felt called to do. And I think on another level, she seeks the personal, even what I might describe as a political path. Becoming a missionary might be the best way for her to get out of Princeton, New Jersey, out of New Jersey itself, out of the United States, out of the society in which she had been born into slavery. Becoming a missionary was a way to, if not achieve, exercise her freedom. And in the end, it's another Princeton Theological Seminary who gives Betsy Stockton her chance. And that is Charles Samuel Stewart. Uh, Stewart was a former student of, of Asheville Greens at Princeton as an undergraduate. Uh, he goes uh, off to become a lawyer, realizes he's falling into corruption, and goes back to the Theological Seminary. Uh, and, uh, and he himself decides that he wants to go on a mission, and he's going to take his brand new wife with him. Uh, Harry. And so it's Charles Stewart who makes the arrangements for himself, his wife Harriet, and Betsy Stockton to be part of this larger missionary family on the Thames. And before leaving, before leaving for New Haven, Charles Samuel Stewart and Betsy Stockton go visit Asheville Green in his study one night on September 25th, 1822. They have a long and fairly tearful conversation, and at the end of it, Ashford Green writes in his diary, they went east, I went west. That is, they were going to New Haven, he was going to Philadelphia, and he figured he'd never see them again. And so off they go. Off Stewart and Stockton go uh, away from Princeton, up to New Haven, onto this whale ship, the Thames, and then around Cape Horn and to Hawaii. 
for Betsy Stockton, it's not an easy choice, but I think it's a critical choice. It's clearly a watershed-like event, maybe the most significant choice in her life, especially for this woman born into slavery who exercises her freedom by leaving. Well, the rest of her life I recount in the book, and again, I'll be happy to discuss any part of that uh, tonight. Her two-plus years uh, uh, working in Hawaii as a teacher on Maui, her coming back to America with the Stewarts, going first to Cooperstown, New York, then going to Philadelphia, where she becomes the principal in an infant school, that is a school for two- to five-year-olds, or for black two- to five-year-olds, the segregated school. She goes to Cooperstown again in 1830 when Harriet uh, Stewart dies. But finally, she spends the last 30 plus years of her life back in Princeton. Again, I want to pause this image because I think the, the perspective is very important. You see in the background Nassau Hall, the main building uh, on the Princeton campus. You see cutting in front where the carriage is Nassau Street. But running out of Nassau Hall is this walkway, and as it crosses the, f the fence, which separates Princeton from the rest of the community, the college. It crosses Nassau Street and then becomes Witherspoon Street. Witherspoon Street is where the black community lives. And that's still true pretty much today. I talk about Princeton as a, a, a tale of two streets. Uh, the college and the academic community on that side of Nassau Street, the Witherspoon Street community to the other side. In 1860, a census taker in Princeton, a man named Eli Stoniker, goes around town knocking on every door, and he comes to Betsy Stockton's house and asks her the requisite questions about that the census wants to know about. And one of those questions has to do with her race. Uh, and so he identifies her on the census sheet as mulatto, mixed race. The, the categories are white, for which he puts no mention, that's the default, mulatto or black. And so Stoniker counts some 126 other mulatto people in Princeton, 495 people that are listed as black, and again, he's the one who makes the determination. You know, you must be mulatto, you must be black. But it's a total of 621 people in all, people of color, about 16% of Princeton's population. And that's a very high percentage for a northern town uh, on the eve of the Civil War. But I think most important, Stoniker lists Betsy Stockton's occupation as teacher. She's the only person of color in Princeton who bears that title. The census shows that she also shows that she's living alone, a household of one, no family, no husband, no children. And we can only speculate why, and I might invite your speculation later on this evening. Was it a, a simply a commitment to her calling? Was it a desire for independence, not to be burdened down by a husband? Was it a question of her sexuality? It could be any one of those. It could be all three. It's very, very hard to know, and certainly Betsy Stockton herself doesn't tell us. But in a sense, I think the whole black community in Princeton, those 600 plus people were her family. Her title of teacher was a central element of her identity in Princeton and it stayed that through her life. Sometimes she would be called uh, Betsy Stockton, late missionary to the Sandwich Islands. That identity stayed with her forever, too. But she was the, uh, the matriarch of the black community in Princeton throughout the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. And after she died, people talk about how she carried that matriarchal identity in a, a regal fashion. And again, this woman who had been born into slavery becomes this remarkable figure in this town. Now, I, I want to close with one last consideration, one question, and that is the bigger picture. How do we locate Betsy Stockton, this one individual in history? How do we locate her in historical memory? And I, I want to be very clear about that. Uh, she wasn't an outspoken orator for abolition like Frederick Douglass. She was not a promoter of women's rights like Sojourner Truth. Uh, she was not a heroic liberator like Harriet Tubman. 
And those three people certainly deserve their special places in the pantheon of antebellum protest and resistance, especially for black people. And yes, like those three who were so widely traveled throughout America and in the antebellum era, Betsy Stockton had also been very widely traveled throughout the first half of her life, all the way around the world and back and forth. But then in the second half of her life, she spent that in one place, Princeton, New Jersey, doing essentially one thing. And that was helping to build and sustain the institutions, both the church and the school, that helped build and sustain that town's black community. And she did it day after day, year after year, always in a hostile racial context that pervaded Princeton, that pervaded the state of New Jersey, that pervaded, frankly, the North as well as the South. And I think it's always important to make that, that uh, distinction. It's not simply the, 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 the South that it is the land of racial oppression. The North could be as well. In fact, I argue in the book that in a town like Princeton, Betsy Stockton's persistence was a form of resistance. And my point in the book and this evening is that that sort of dogged, day-to-day, -day grassroots labor needs to be acknowledged. It needs to count somehow in history. And if you go to Princeton, you'll see that. Because people in Princeton's black community have known that for over a century. She has long been a part of that community's memory. If you go to the Witherspoon Presbyterian Church, uh, her church, the one that she helped found, you'll find this remarkable window it was installed sometime in the 17, I'm sorry, 1870s, 1880s, I'm not sure when, but presented by the scholars of Elizabeth Stockton. And those scholars are not scholars at the university. They're not Princeton scholars. They're scholars, her students from her Sunday school, her students from her public school. There's also a plaque installed in uh, 1906 a uh, brass plaque that's still there. Uh, and it talks about Betsy Stockton's life and also her importance uh, to the community. Uh, this plaque was installed in 1906. And at, this, at the ceremony for that installation, I know, I certainly think, that one of the people in the audience was Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, the famous actor, activist, athlete, uh, Robeson grew up in Princeton. He was eight years old at the time. His father uh, had been the pastor, William Drew Robinson, had been pastor of the Princeton, uh, of the Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church. He had been pushed out of that job, but the Robesons were still living in town, and I have to believe that Paul Robeson sat in the sanctuary that day and looked at that window as you can still look at it today. <coughs> The Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church also commissioned a painting of Betsy Stockton. This was in 1999. Uh, it now hangs at the Princeton Theological Seminary on the way upstairs to the li in the library. Uh, and there's also a plaque outside the church. Uh, this was put there in 2004, uh, the New Jersey Women's Heritage Trail, which gives actually a fairly nice brief summary of Betsy Stockton's life. And this is one of the, the uh, items I saw that said, this is an interesting story. Maybe it bears a little more study. That's the black community in Princeton. She's now being commemorated by uh, the academic community. Uh, in 2013, uh, a friend of mine, a professor at Princeton named Marty Sandweiss, uh, started the Princeton Slavery Project. It started on basically no budget, no institutional support. But she got together an archivist and a handful of students, first year students, and they had a, a seminar and they started looking into the history of Princeton University and its connections to slavery and race. And now there's some 900 pages of documents on the Princeton Slavery website, uh, and I'm including mine on, on Betsy Stockton, but I'm enormously proud to be part of this, uh, this effort. And I'm very proud of my friend, Arnie Sandweiss, for putting this together. In 2018, the university, Princeton University, created the Elizabeth Betsy Stockton Garden, which is uh, between the library and Nassau Street. I think it's an interesting symbolic location. The borders of the college, but also the library where all the uh, study, the intellect, takes place. 
In 2019, uh, Princeton also put a plaque in front of the alumni house, and the alumni house used to be the president's house, where Betsy Stockton had lived uh, in the 18-teens with Ashbrook Green. In fact, uh, the first nine presidents of Princeton, including Ashbrook Green, uh, were all slaveholders. And so these are the names of the people uh, who were enslaved and lived in the house with those presidents. Then in 2020, the Princeton Theological Seminary established the Betsy Stockton Center for Black Church Studies. It's now in operation with a, a, a terrific director, Dr. David Lattimore, who's done in the first year just really remarkable work in that case. In 2020, uh, the town of Cooperstown, Cooperstown, New York, where Betsy Stockton chose to be buried along with the Stewarts in the family plot, they secured a grant to raise Betsy Stockton's tombstone back up. It had been lying flat on the ground, as you can see on the left, and here's the after picture, fairly recently. I've heard, and only heard, that somebody in the Cooperstown's Glimmer Glass Opera is working on a Betsy Stockton opera, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> She's been getting, of course, some attention in Hawaii at the Mission House's site. There's a reenactor who tells the story of Betsy Stockton. And now, of course, we've got a group of people from Hawaii here tonight. We'll be traveling around to various Betsy Stockton sites, and I think it'll be a, a, a wonderful tour for them, a wonderful tribute to her. And yes, there is one other prominent Hawaiian, or at least a former resident of Hawaii, Barack Obama, who wrote a letter of, about Betsy Stockton in 2020. And Obama focuses on her intellect and piety, yes, but he also, as he so often does, on the power of hope that he sees in Betsy Stockton. Barack Obama's hopeful, I'm, I'm hopeful too, that maybe there's more to come. Maybe there's more to come about Betsy Stockton, maybe more books, maybe more poems, maybe a movie, maybe an opera. But I also hope there's more to come about other people too. People who like Betsy Stockton have stories that haven't been told, have stories that need to be told, can be told, and I think will be told by the next round of writers, including researchers like me who struggle to work through the scraps and the shards of evidence until there's a bigger and clearer picture, maybe even another book. Thank you very much. to take whatever questions you may have, both from uh, folks who are here tonight and uh, people who are seeing this in virtual fashion. But I will open the floor uh, with no moderator. This is dangerous, but you know, I'll take your questions. Mm. Yeah. What happened to Betsy Stockton in Hawaii? Why did she come back? She came back largely because of her, her very deep friendship with the Stewarts, Charles Samuel Stewart, Harriet Stewart. Um, she helped deliver the first Stewart child on board the Thames. And she was remarkably, became remarkably close to them. She talks about how her love for them grows as they travel. But uh, Harriet Stewart, uh, once they were on the islands, uh, was repeatedly sick, as was Betsy Stockton herself, and frankly, as were many of the women uh, in the missionary family. And so finally it was determined uh, that uh, Harriet had to leave. The thinking at the time was that, that women needed to be in a colder climate, which Hawaii was not. So they left, and they went first to London for a while, then back to uh, the United States, back to Cooperstown, where uh, Harriet had, had been. Um, so Betsy went with them, and she was listed on the ship's manifest coming home as nurse. But that was, I think, just a, 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 a way that some bureaucrat wrote her. She had actually been considered by the Stewarts, and I think, frankly, by herself as a member of their family. And she stays very, very close to that family. She leaves Philadelphia in order to come back when Harriet Stewart dies in 1830. She takes the Stewart children to Princeton in 1833 to put Charles Seaforth Stewart, the young boy born on board the ship, to put him in school at a very Tony private school there. The Stewarts uh, leave after a while, but Betsy Stockton stays there. But she leaves because of her commitment to her affection for 
the stewards. And I think the story of Betsy Stockton, the steward, her ability uh, to reach across lines of race and class is very important. I always say she was a pillar of the black community in Princeton, but a bridge to the white. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an, that's an important uh, uh, role that she, she carries out. Uh, Professor, I just want to thank you for illuminating this story. Uh, you know, a lot of history for African Americans have been erased or unseen. This is good that uh, you were telling the story. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Also, the Stockton family. Uh, what's their relationship with, uh, with the, this side of the Stockton family? There is no claim? Well, you said there was a half brother, half. You think there was a half? No, the, okay. Half the, family, right? Sorry. There were two very prominent Stocktons mm -hmm. uh, about the time Betsy was born. The Stocktons were one of the first families to uh, take up land in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, in the 17th century. They also took up slaveholding in the 17th century. Uh, but uh, Richard Stockton, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a slaveholder, uh, was one of the brothers. Robert Stockton, into whose household Betsy had been born, uh, was the other. Uh, one of Richard Stockton's sons, Robert Field Stockton, I'm sorry the names, <laughs> they didn't use many names in that family. Uh, there were about four Betsy Stocktons, uh, three white and Alex uh, But so the Stocktons remained a very uh, prominent family in Princeton. Uh, there's still a Stockton Lane in Princeton. There's uh, Stockton, Richard Stockton College uh, in, in New Jersey. Uh, one of their, uh, I guess, most significant descendants uh, was Robert Field Stockton, who became uh, the Commodore, uh, and he had a rather illustrious military career. But uh, he was uh, a great advocate of colonization, that is, taking black people, both free and enslaved, and sending them to Africa. Not back to Africa, because most of them had never been there, but just sent them to Africa to get them out. Uh, Robert, Stockton, Robert Field Stockton was also part of the Peace Commission in 1860-61, right before the Civil War, trying to find some kind of negotiated settlement that would not really deal with the question of slavery. So he was, as I put it, soft on slavery. Uh, but the Stockton family remained very prominent throughout, certainly the antebellum era. Uh, and there are still, I think, some, uh, some traces there. Thank you. So your colleague had a question. I'm curious about how she was able to educate herself. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very important question, and the answer to that is we don't really know. Uh, we do know that she made use of uh, Asheville, Asheville Green's library, but you can imagine a, a Presbyterian pastor and a college president, he wasn't reading uh, fluff. <laughs> Uh, we think that one of his sons, his youngest son, Jacob, helped teach her to read. But after that, she was, I think, off to the intellectual races. Her story is not unlike that of Frederick Douglass, who learns to read uh, somewhat himself, but then once he learns to read, really takes it to, uh, to the next level. Uh, when she's sent away to Woodbury, New Jersey, to live with Nathaniel Todd and his family, Nathaniel Todd is a Presbyterian pastor, but he also runs a school. And so his house also is full of books. Maybe not quite as full of books as Ashford Green's, but full of books. And so even though she's working hard there, she's helping to take care of twin girls and the, the, uh, the Todd family, I think, I suspect, that's when she really learns to read. Ashford Green later somewhat takes credit for her learning to read, not that he taught her, uh, but somehow he said she learned to read uh, in my household, in my family. Uh, and so that's it. it it's a, it's a, a great example, a great example of self-education uh, when nobody is reaching out to teach them. Yeah. Along those same lines, and I know there's very little historical stories, but do you think that the brief relationship with Elizabeth Stockton and the continuation of the same relationship with Robert Stockton uh, during that time is using actual being helpful? Do you think there was any contact still there, or do you think that, is there anything you think you shed light on that? With Robert Stockton, who Robert, Robert Stockton, you know, being the, the father-in-law of Elizabeth, and Elizabeth 
and her relationship yeah. and how it goes in Canada. Elizabeth Stockton, uh, Ashford Green's wife, uh, had been very sick. Yellow fever had been rampant throughout uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, especially Philadelphia and, and Princeton. And so the, the Greens went back and forth between Philadelphia and Princeton. Uh, but that was, the, by the time, um, by the time Betsy had come into their household, and it had to be sometime uh, between 1798, question mark, when we think she was born, uh, that's what her gravestone says, uh, and 1804 when Green corrects her. Sometime there, in her first six years, she comes into the Green household. Elizabeth Stockton Green uh, is repeatedly very ill. And I have to imagine that Betsy Stockton, even though she's a young child, does play some role in, in attending to Elizabeth Stockton. Ashford Green writes that he, he cared for his wife day in, day out, never mentions Betsy. But I have to, if you're a six-year-old child, an enslaved child in a household, you're doing something. You're cleaning up and probably pretty unpleasant something as well. Robert Stockton, um, I don't see any contact uh, with him by her. Um, she doesn't come back with the Greens to uh, the Stockton Hill in the time when she's growing up in uh, Philadelphia, at least is not, not as far as I know. But I do think, again, her taking the Stockton name, uh, it might seem almost counterintuitive, but uh, here she comes back to Princeton in 1816, and I think takes the Stockton name because she says, I am part of this, I, I came from this prominent family. There are other black people in the Presbyterian Church named Stockton as well, but they're not direct cannibals. Um, and again, as far as I know, there's no uh, uh, descendant from Betsy Stockton. Wish there were. Sorry, yes. Yes. Uh, as a historian, what caused you to seek out this particular person to write a book about? Well, I, you know, I showed the plaque that's in front of the, the uh, Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church. Um, it looked like an interesting story. Uh, it's one that I thought, frankly, had not been told well or fully. Uh, I had this remarkable opportunity. I just uh, retired from teaching, and so I had this year-long fellowship at a remarkable uh, uh, research institution and said, well, here's a chance to look into it. And again, I, in the beginning, I didn't know that this would, this would work out. I really didn't, because there was so little evidence written by Betsy Stockton. But um, I think it was partly the challenge of doing this. I'd written other books where I, I just, uh, in 2017, I'd, I'd written a book on John James Audubon, about whom there are thousands of pages of his own writing, almost too much that you can handle. Here was the other side of it, a woman who left us nothing. And so the question was, how could I fill in some of those gaps? How could I find e evidence about her enough to make a story? And I think I have. One other question. Yeah, sure. Um, was he considered mulatto or black? Well, according to the census, she was considered mulatto. Uh -huh. Now, uh, you know, why the census asked that question? It, it started in 1850. They started asking for racial categories, white, black, mulatto. Uh, and again, I think the census taker is one who made that determination, that he would just look at people and say, well, that person must be mulatto, that person must be black. Why the census had it, why they asked that question, I think had a lot to do with racial science in the middle of the 19th century. People were trying to come up with categories. People were trying to say, here's white people, and here's black people, and here's people who are a little bit white, a little bit black. What do we know about their uh, success? What do we know about their intelligence? And I think, frankly, and I've, I've, I've looked in uh, the instructions to the census takers, and all it says is just determine white, black, mulatto. It doesn't say why. But I think it had to do, and it, it might have been, frankly, the Congress is making a concession uh, to Southerners who wanted to have some kind of justification for the racial categories. But um, that's, that's one of those questions I tried to explore, uh, ran into a number of dead ends, but I do think given the, uh, the fascination that many white Americans had with racial science in the 19th century, this, I think, stemmed from that. You mentioned he had no family. Where did she come from? 
I'm sorry? You mentioned in your lecture that you had no family, brothers, and so forth. Yeah. So where did she come from? Well, here's where I have to use the term probably a lot. There is a, a, an enslaved woman on the Stockton, the Robert Stockton estate, Constitution Hill, probably a woman named Celia, because Robert Stockton comes to Asheville Green's house in Philadelphia in 1797, and he's uh, complaining that Celia has run away. And she, he says, you know where she is, and I want her back. And it's a very testy exchange between the father-in-law and the son-in-law, and the woman, his wife is left out of it. So I, I, there's some suspicion this woman named Celia, or Celia, whatever she's called, was probably uh, the birth mother of Betsy Stockton. Uh, and it's pretty clear that the man involved, whoever impregnated Celia, uh, was a white man. Um, and uh, throughout her life, she's identified uh, as mulatto, which is now happily a term we don't use. Uh, but uh, you know, that was, again, her part of her identity. Yeah? Do you have any details about the uh, school she formed at the Valley? Mm -hmm. I wish I had more. Uh, I, I uh, you know, had accounts of her, uh, of, of her teaching. Um, I think that if you want to get into educational philosophy, she was probably using the Lancastrian style. That is where a teacher would have, uh, you know, children learning mostly by rote, you know, uh, memorizing, and then have other child monitors monitor the younger ones. Uh, as far as I can tell, it was probably on some version of the Lancastrian model, because that's what I think the Binghams had been using. But again, you know, there's always uh, pedagogy, pedagogical philosophy and pedagogical practice. What actually happens in uh, the classroom or whatever space she was teaching in. And I think I have to use, and perhaps you have to use, uh, your imagination to think, what's it like for this uh, uh, woman in her early 20s, uh, mid 20s, uh, with all the, and she starts teaching not just the children of uh, the Ali'i, the, the uh, leaders, but uh, ordinary children. And what a remarkable step that is, uh, both for her and for the missionary movement, and I think for uh, the people of the island. Here's somebody offering them uh, literacy. And one of the things I talk about in the book is I think that for uh, the, uh, the Hawaiian people, uh, there are two sides to literacy. One was, yes, you, you become literate, you read the Bible, you, you, you can become a pious person. But also in the world they lived in, in the competition with merchants and, and the whalers and mariners and so forth, uh, literacy was a very valuable tool not just for spiritual, but for economic well-being. And so I think the willingness, the desire of uh, Hawaiian people, leadership on down, to uh, become literate, and in the process, numerate, uh, is very important. But in terms of the actual teaching style, I don't know, when she goes to Philadelphia and runs the infant school for these two to five-year-olds, it's in the Pestalozzian method, <laughs> and again, here my uh, uh, knowledge of uh, European teaching methods, uh, gets a bit complicated. But that's a very different style of teaching, much more like Montessori school. Now, she has a school of up to 100 children, ages 2 to 5. And she is to her and one assistant. And you can imagine yourself in that circumstance. <laughs> and yet, she gets glowing reports. There's a group of white women who come around, they're in the visiting committee. They said the school's flourishing, Betsy Stockton's remarkable. Uh, you know, she, she's got the, the children doing very, very well. And then for one short period of time, a couple of weeks, Betsy Stockton is out. She gets sick and goes away for a while. And so the white women on the visiting committee think, well, we'll take over. <laughs> and they suffer the fate that substitute teachers do all the time. It's just chaos. And so they say, we'll just wait till she gets back. <laughs> but I will say, all reports from, uh, 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 from Maui, from Philadelphia, from Princeton, that she's a remarkably good, a, a terrific teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was that after you were in um, Maui in 2016 and went into the bishop's home? Mm -hmm. And you really identify a lot of times, of course, when you see people that have come from Connecticut and the parents. But I don't recall something mentioned back then. So we see now. 
because of all your research. I know in Honolulu you're saying she's being um, depicted as a character and there's some history there. Yes. But I'm just wondering if the Lama uh, Honolulu the Maui, if she, if it's getting out about her. I would have to ask my uh, Hawaiian colleagues about that. Chris? I'm chair of the Government of Hawaii next May. Okay. And she'll be my, Craig Book will be my wife, and Bruce Sawyer will be my wife, and Tahitians too. So. Okay. But I think the timing of the, I'll say, the discovery of Betsy Stockton by the white community, you know, it, it comes from the, the, the teens of the century. It's not because of my work, it's because of uh, you know, the work of other people, but there has been this kind of, uh, I won't say rediscovery, but a discovery of her. And again, in Princeton, she's been uh, a part of the memory of the black community for well over a century. It just hadn't moved into uh, three blocks down the street to the white community. And now it's happening. And we could discuss for hours whether or not the, uh, a, a few memorials on the Princeton University campus amount to much. I do think that the, uh, uh, the Betsy Stockton Center for Black Church Studies at the Theological Seminary, that's going to amount to something. Yes, please. Isn't that when you have um, a question from online? I do want to also acknowledge that online some of the questions about how Betsy Stockton learned to read and write. So thank you for raising that in the room. Um, from online, we also have, did Betsy Stockton have anything to do with Joseph Henry, inventor of the electromagnet? While at Princeton in the 1840s, before moving on, he was assigned a free man of color named Sam Parker to work in his laboratory. Do you know anything about that? I do. Uh, and again, uh, Sam Parker didn't just work, he was lit up in the laboratory. Uh, Joseph Henry, who was the first uh, secretary of the Smithsonian, he was no small figure. Um, but he was famous for doing experiments in electricity. And he would use his, um, I'll call him lab assistant, mm -hmm. Sam. Uh, but sometimes uh, send electric shock through him as a kind of demonstration. <laughs> the, the Princeton faction, frankly, uh, was an interesting group. Uh, when I was a freshman there, I lived in Dodd Hall. I thought nothing of the name Dodd. It turns out Albert Dodd uh, was a, a very prominent uh, uh, professor back in the 1840s. He was also the last slaveholding member of the Princeton faculty. And in 1840, he had a household that had one young woman uh, still held in slavery. Uh, nobody mentioned this in freshman week. Nobody's mentioned it uh, until I think uh, the Princeton Slavery Project brought that up. So yeah, I, the, uh, I do know about Joseph Henry, uh, and there is this part of his history that I think needs a little more interrogation by whoever writes the next book on Joseph Henry, to which you're all welcome. <laughs> all right. Wait. One last question from a Hawaiian colleague. Sorry, there's two questions here. Oh, okay. <laughs> your, your title is education, but do you feel that Betsy really felt like education was the most empowering thing that she could offer fellow a lot of black children as a way to uh, ascend the challenges that they were born into? Yes, that, the simple answer is yes. And I use the term education on two sides. One is the education of Betsy Stockton herself, her own self-education, but also the education that she provided. And, 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 and determining to do that uh, by age 20 it became so important to her. And that's what she did throughout her life. There was never a, another career, never another job for her, really. And so yes, I think that she understood that education was critical, especially for the black community, because education had been denied black people so much. Uh, even, frankly, in Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton was an educated town. They didn't give much attention to public education for white people. They didn't give much, they gave even less attention to public education for black people. And that was the role she played. That was the title she had, teacher. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for <laughs> for coming this evening. I believe there might be some books left, I believe. 
um, and some signing downstairs, although I know that there's a tight time frame, so if that's what you'd like to do, we'll go downstairs quickly. If we don't have your email, please sign up for emails from the museum, and of course, we would always welcome your support, either as a member or as a donor. So thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you.